Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. sitting down with Jesse Bone. Jesse's with Filter Studios and he said, Travis, we've got a new movie. We're putting it out. It hasn't been released yet. It's called Transmission. I'd like to watch it with you first in the studio. And as we roll credits, we can then turn the recording on and talk about it. So this is a a very interesting movie. Extremely well done. You guys did a fantastic job putting this together. Thank you. Uh, it's called transmission and it talks about movie or, uh, mycoplasma ovo, ova pneumonia. Did yeah, I say that? Ova right? pneumonia. Okay. Yeah. Pneumonia. Mycoplasma ova pneumonia. Okay. Can you first give me a little bit of a background on yourself and then about the movie and we're going to talk about both of these. Okay. Um, yeah. So again, well, first of all, thanks for having me here. Um, thanks for trying something new, um, and, uh, viewing the film and, um, yeah, going through it this way, um, being a bit unprepared, I guess, um, and, and just kind of looking at the film and then talking about it. So, uh, background on me, mm. um, I don't know how far back do you want to go? Well, you're a pilot, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's start there. There so, you go. Um, yeah, coming out of high school, I knew I was dead set on, uh, becoming a pilot. So that was my, that was my career path. I, uh, I, I was a bit of a dummy in high school and I was a C plus student. So I, I, uh, worked extra hard and got my math up and then applied to flight school in Abbotsford. Mm. To, it was the university college of the Fraser Valley. Yep. Now UFE. Um, and it, uh, worked pretty hard to get into the program. I remember going through a big application process and interview, which was crazy, but got in, um, for the bachelor of, uh, business administration in aviation and, uh, got my pilot's license there. Um, and then, um, after that became a flight dispatcher, mm. did not become a pilot. Okay. Um, so I got a little preview into the industry and, uh, I was a flight dispatcher for, for a while for a small airline. And I really found out that being a pilot and, uh, being away a long time and just that lifestyle wasn't really, wasn't really for me. Right. Uh, not for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I love flying. Um, the, the idea of flying, you know, flying small planes is, 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 a is a big passion. Mm. Um, but, uh, the career path didn't work out. So I, uh, um, just kind of messed around in the lower mainland, had a bunch of miscellaneous jobs. I remember I was an Ikea furniture, um, installer for a while. That was fun out of the Ikea here in Richmond. Sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then, uh, my wife and I got married and we moved to the island and kind of put roots down there unintentionally, but we just kind of, we call it on the island, we call it barnacling. So we just barnacled on the island and, uh, mm. haven't really, haven't really stopped, um, loving it, loving living there. It's a local island term, is it? Barnacling? Barnacling or barnacle. I don't know. You just don't go anywhere because oh, yeah. it, we're, we're pretty happy on the island. So it's, uh, it's difficult to to get us to come off of the island. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then, yeah, just did, just kind of found, fuddled around for a little while. And then I, after we had my son, um, I decided to, as as we have a new baby, decided to start a new career in my own business as a photographer. Mm -hmm. So as a photographer for three years, you know, started out in weddings, 
got, uh, did portrait photography. Do you have a background to that or you just pick up a camera and say, I'm going to be a photographer? That's pretty much it. Learn a DIY, train myself. You just watching um, Peter McKinnon on uh, YouTube. Peter and- McKinnon didn't exist when I was uh, <laughs> starting. Um, I was ra- I was like that part of that new wave of when digital cameras started to come out. Mm-hmm. Like when the when the five D came out, mm-hmm. that was like revolutionary. It was. Yeah. But they was. also brought in so the five D and five D Mark II brought video to the. That's f- right. Exactly. So, so you got a little flavor for video at the same time as doing. Well, i I was pretty I was pretty deep in the wedding photography scene. I even hosted some uh, some like gatherings and workshops. We brought some friends from New York, some pretty high-end wedding photographers. And the weird thing that was happening around that time was this thing called fusion. So it was where um, wedding photographer, photographers were starting to roll video clips while they were shooting. Mm. And then they'd do like a slideshow and then they'd show like the bride and the groom pictures of their first se- viewing mm. um, but then they'd roll a little clip in there as well so right. it was like this like mix of videos like an awkward stage for video and and photo right because sure. never had a photographer had the ability to roll video so easily right from the same camera that they could get the, the same pictures from that was revolutionary when they came out with that yeah the- yeah yeah so i was part of that and so you know me being a photographer um the way that you know kind of filter started. Um, Tash and I knew each other from the photography scene. Um, we were both on the island in Nanaimo and um, I was starting to get a bunch of clients ask for video projects. Mm. And then he he was working at the news station and he was getting a bunch of side jobs and people asking him to do side work as well. Because right. he did like, you know, the, you know, come down and pick up a car and, you know, come down to Bob's junkyard and, you know, right. we give you your car for $500 or whatever. He did those commercials mm. and it wasn't really fulfilling his creative side. Really? Yeah. <laughs> would have thought, huh? <laughs> yeah. So it, um, so yeah, it was just this, this weird time where this fusion was happening, video and photo were melding. And I was like, I know how to shoot photos. Yeah. I got a ton of people asking me to do video, like, should, can we work together or something? And then we just kind of sat down and decided, heck, let's just do it. Let's just jump right in and- Start doing video. Yeah. I remember the day peeling my Jesse Bowen photography stickers off the side of my truck. And uh, and then the, the next, we were just all of a sudden a video production company. Your filter studios. That's right. Oh, Going man, from- it, it took us forever to find a name, forever. It why was, filter? So, I, well, w- again, it was, um, you know, we looked at what we kind of do and we, we kind of filter things through and we, because we, what we really do is take a lot on from the client mm. and help either translate that or remind them or, or help build out, um, I don't like to say strategy, but it is a strategy to accomplish their goal. So we kind of filter things. Gotcha. It's a little cheesy, but whatever it works. It works. It works. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of um, how filter started, and then Tash and I um, started filter, and we were a be all and end all. We just did video production to pay the bills. That's all. All we we kind of did. Um, and about five, I would say about six years into it. Um, we, um, it was, it was actually kind of crazy. We, I emailed some, some well-known people in the industry and I just said, Hey, we had a, a client that said they, um, they want to do a feature length documentary, not this one, uh, mm-hmm. a previous client. And, uh, I'm like, can you help us? Can you, like, I, I don't have a mentor. We don't, we, we don't like, we don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. So can, like, we'll figure it out, but is there anything you have to offer? And they're like, come on down to Portland. Um, we'll sit you down for four or five days and we'll talk it through and we'll work it out. And, um, through that, they kind of mentored us and we, we kind of started a mentorship with them. But through that, um, they kind of asked us some key questions about looking a little bit deeper, Mm -hmm. um, into uh, what we do. And so we, um, you know, came back from that mentorship um, and just kind of evaluated. They essentially asked us one question. They said, what do you want your work to say when you put the cameras up at mm. the end of your career? And he said, we never thought about that. We've just been like heads down grinding to pay bills. Right. Like we've never come up for air and said, uh, I don't know that we could pay bills. <laughs> what a game changer. <laughs> so that, it was, that mind shift. Eh? Yeah. And it was just one small question because yeah. to them it was like, yeah, what do you think? And we're like, oh my gosh, we haven't even 
thought about that. So then we then we uh, we came back and um, Tash and I both love to hunt and fish and be in the outdoors. And so we said, okay, let's focus in on the hunting and fishing industry. Cause that's, what's closest to us. Mm-hmm. So whatever's near and dear to us can really, um, translate better as a creative and, um, those types of things. Um, so then, so it's been about five years. Yeah. We've been, we've been a production company for coming up on 10 years now. So for about five four or five years of it, um, we've really focused on doing, you know, conservation minded work, whether that's on the ocean or the mountains. Um, and it's just translated into doing more meaningful, uh, more passion driven work, which depending on the goal, but most, most, uh, most clients want that kind of thing. (laughs) Does that pay the bills? That's the, that's the golden question. Um, (laughs) and that's, that's the waters you're navigating, right? Right. So, I mean, I (laughs) can It doesn't fully pay the bills, but we're getting close. <laughs> right. It's um, just because, especially when you deal with the nonprofit world, which mm-hmm. is a lot of what these are, mm-hmm. and you just have to, you know, put your passion first and uh, know things that will kind of work out towards the end. So the universal unfold as it should. Yes, exactly. You know, I honestly do believe that if you put whatever your goal is. Make it a worthwhile goal. Make it something that's worthwhile to you. And you make that your guiding light, your North Star. Everything else will figure itself out in the process. If you start worrying too much about, is that going to pay the bills and make that your motivator and make that your driving light, you're going to lose the heart and the passion and you're probably not going to have the money that you're chasing anyways. You're going to be behind it. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And it's such a, I think an underrated mentality, um, towards, especially, Self-employment, uh, creative self-employment mm. is like grind yourself into a pulp and try to get the job done and put it out there. Well, you start setting boundaries, right. both for yourself yeah. and for your clients. Boundaries as to what you will do, where you'll go, or uh, sure, the money's good, but is, is this something I really think is going to be worthwhile? Will I feel good about myself after I finish this? Or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I did a podcast with... Uh, Lucas Hogue, he's a country music star and Mm -hmm. he's, um, talking about a very similar concept. He's been very successful with what he's done. He says, you know, people come up and they want me to do A, B or C. They'll say, I want, can you give me a hundred grand? We've got this big thing that we're, we're putting together. We need some donations. He says, no, but Mm -hmm. I have some talents and I can lend my talents to you. And through that, we can build, we can grow some revenue for you. We can build something for you, but he's making so many, both personal and business connections and he's doing something he truly loves. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it sounds like you're doing a a very similar sort of thing. You're looking at what it is that you love to do and you're surrounding yourself with other like-minded people. Yeah, that's key. And, and a big thing that, um, a a few years ago, Tash and I really, um, as a company and, and as, I mean, we spend so much time together, my wife always, um, jokes, you know, when I say, oh, we're going to this place. Oh, we, we were going to Haiti for, a, I'm like, oh, ta- we're going to <laughs> Haiti. And she's like, we're going to Haiti. I'm like, oh no. I mean, Tash and I, yeah. and she always jokes. And Your says, work wife. I remember when we was us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, we spent man. a lot of time together and we've kind of grown a lot. We've made like, like we started hunting again at the same time together and kind of grew into that. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's been a, a crazy evolution. So you're now marrying your passion for the outdoors and for hunting and fishing with your work. You've been doing that for, so you've been doing the work on the video side for 10 years. How long have you been doing the mostly outdoors yeah, that's probably been about, uh, five solid years of that, of really putting, putting out, I mean, we still have corporate work that we do or, you know, that we have to, I mean, we still have bills to pay. Mm-hmm. So, and it's, it's not like, um, doing nonprofit work pays all the bills. It mm-hmm. pays some bills, but not all of them. So there's, there's other stuff that we do, um, along the way, but we've really tried to highlight this is the work that we want to do and, and for good reason, because it means something and therefore the work can do. And it's, it's honestly, um, when you get to do stuff that you're passionate about, and I mean, you're creative as well, you know, that when, when you have, 
um, you know, when you get back from a shoot and you know that you just love the images so much, mm. you're in there, you're starring, you're like, yes, 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 <laughs> quick edit. Oh, yeah, it does look how I want yeah. it. Like you're just energized by it. Totally. So it's the same thing on on a on a on a bigger scale when you're dealing with you know film production and, and stuff that means something to you. Mm -hmm. um, and and it kind of has these energizing moments along the way. So it's an issue that you're passionate about, but then all of a sudden somebody that is also passionate about an issue, but then they also let you in, mm -hmm. into their inner circle and mm. share their story and share their passions. Then it's just, oh, there's another level of engagement and like of, of, of how it, it just touches to your core on a different level. Um, yeah. And it energizes yeah. um, along the way. That's why I started the Silver Core podcast so people can share their passion with others. Right. And for my own selfish reasons, <laughs> so I can share that as well, right? Because yeah. that's, it's, it's infectious, it's contagious. Yeah. But do you find, do you find that having the camera with you outdoors takes you out of the outdoors that you love so much? Yeah, I think that's a maturing process. Um, there's, there's, <laughs> it's like, um, it evolves, okay. I think, in my in my like best way to put it. Um, yes, there's been like a, a big thing that we did to start was we do a lot of productions and fishing. Lots of we we're on the river all the time. Um, I remember we were up fishing on the Nass River, filming a steelhead fishing show, mm -hmm. um, and um, I was like desperate to just can I just grab the rod? And <laughs> I'm up here. There's like steelhead the size of Chinook salmon up here. Like it's just amazing. Um, and it was like four or five days. And, and so it does get in the way a bit, but you're also like, you have gratitude and thankfulness that you are where you are and you're getting paid to be there. Sure. Um, and, and again, it's, it's a mix of, in my mind, just putting yourself in a different mode. Like, okay, I'm here to shoot this. I'm not here to get, you know, I'll get what I can out of it by doing mm -hmm. a good job shooting this. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to be like bummed out or, you know, I'm not going to sacrifice getting the shot because I'm like, oh, I'll just put the camera down for a minute and I'll just go, you right. know, float one, one swing, one fly over here. <laughs> um, and then meanwhile, you know, the guy gets a fish on and you miss the shot or whatever. It's like, right, okay, right. I'm in this mode. Just be grateful for what you can get. And so this movie that you just did, how long did it take you to do? <laughs> uh, that's the... That's Actually, the funny one about it. Let's start at the beginning, like how you got into it, like you're interested mm -hmm. in it. And then. So, yeah, it, it all started back in, I think it's June of 2019, um, where, uh, Sabrina from the Wild Sheep Society of BC mm -hmm. contacted us through, I think a mutual contact, um, in the industry and just said, Hey, we have this, um, issue that's going on and we want to do a film about it. We don't know what the film is. We don't know what all we want to do. The main goal is to raise awareness about this uh, disease, mycoplasma ova pneumoniae. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just dug in and we just learned about it. Um, there was um, like when the, the farmers moved down, um, we just went and shot some stuff because we didn't know. So we did this big discovery mission along the way of just like learning what the real issues are, learning what, um, this disease is and how it works. We, uh, and so, um, back then, yeah, the society just said, we need to raise awareness of this. That's our number one goal is to raise awareness, but it needs to be a balanced message. It can't, can't say hunters are blaming farmers or, you know, vice versa. We need to just lay this out there as it's an issue that we can all collaborate with mm -hmm. and we can all deal with at the same time when we're supporting each other. So, so you've spent some time working on this. You and I just watched a movie. The listeners might not know what movie is. Yes. Well, I mean, that's, that's the whole point of, of what the film is. So mycoplasma ova pneumoniae or movi mm -hmm. for short is a, as a bacteria. So it's a bacteria that, um, originates in domestic sheep. Um, and domestic sheep for thousands of years have been in close contact with each other. Um, they've learned and learned, no, I don't know if they've learned, but they've evolved and, and kind of, uh, grown with this bacteria and, you know, can live with it. Mm. Um, the issue that happens and it's similar to, you know, how we were dealing with COVID, um, is that it's spread through droplets. So, so nose to nose contact or sneezing or sharing grazing grounds, mm. grazing grounds. Grazing grounds? Yeah. That's right. Graze, grows, browse, <laughs> on, yeah. 
<laughs> it's always remember it grows, stuff grows. Right. Yeah. Okay. Browsing branches. <laughs> oh, good. I like that. Okay, I remember yeah. that. See, ADHD um, learning tip. So you have a, a flock of domestic sheep um, in, and and this is where it really um, comes into contention is when they're in bighorn range like the kootenays and like the fraser river systems um all of these where there's populations of people and that kind of overlap with where typically bighorn ranges are there are some thin horn overlaps up north and stuff like that but it's gonna ask yeah it's mainly it's mainly a bighorn thing basically just because of the density Mm. and the close proximity so mainly when the when the ewes are in estrus during the rut um, the bighorns, which will also be around because there's really good grass and grazing um, food all over where domestic sheep are. Mm. But specifically when they're in estrus and when the rut's happening, the rams will come in and they'll scent the ewes, sometimes even mate. Um, and so that's where the the contact happens. That's where domestic sheep and wild sheep will um, either sneeze or, like I said, share grazing um, spots and... Um, uh, you know, actually physically touch noses mm-hmm. because they're checking each other out. Sure. Um, and that's where those droplets are transmitted. That's where the bacteria goes from domestic sheep to wild sheep. And then essentially the wild sheep just don't have the immune system to deal with that bacteria. Mm. Um, and it typically leads to a pneumonia. Now, there are a lot of uh, mature uh, rams and ewes of wild sheep that can... Um, live with it for a, a while. Some can't live with it and are dead quickly. Mm. Um, but the the big concern, the big evidence that they see on the ground is uh, lamb production. So right. a, a mom will, will have the bacteria and be living with it, but constantly shedding it from the nose. So when she has that lamb and sheds the bacteria, because they're, I mean, they're licking and nosing their lambs, mm. especially when they're born. So a newborn lamb that gets this bacteria and then that b- bacteria usually leads to some sort of infectious disease, which is most com- mo- the most common one is uh, pneumonia. Mm. Um, and then, you know, a you know, two week old lamb with pneumonia doesn't last too long. Um, no, there's out there. What, what were they saying? Six to eight weeks was sort of the average expectancy yeah. of any yeah. lamb for, from a ewe that has movie. Exactly. So that's one of the, that's one of the key signs that they see on the landscape is they'll see, um, herds with no lambs coming through. Mm. So, um, when they go for their lamb counts, if they see very little lamb production or zero lamb production, which is, you know, one of the, the, the herd that we talked about in the film, they've, there were two years with zero lambs. Mm. or three years previous, um, zero lambs, they've been counting them. So mm. there's a big alarm bells going off like, oh, okay, these lambs aren't surviving. Um, and there, there's probably multiple factors, but you know, the fact that zero lambs are surviving is, is cause for concern. Right. So you started this pre-COVID when you started doing yeah. the filming, right? Yes, exactly. So we, we started, um, basically did our first filming 20, the fall of end of summer and fall of 2019 and then um had a plan of the film we were out filming it and then covid hit Mm. um and then we had to you know a a lot of our um initial plan was we were doing door knocking we were going in people's houses you know stuff like that you just couldn't you couldn't even approach with covid no um so we just had to just kind of roll with it you know um and thankfully the society was very patient and they, they, they told us from the start, make it good. Don't worry. We'll work through these delays. We'll work through these other issues. Just make it good. We need to tell the right story. That's how important this Mm -hmm. issue is and, and how important it is to raise awareness about it. So, uh, we, I mean, we had like, you know, COVID had a little bit of a break mm-hmm. and everybody was kind of okay with it for a bit. So we did a little bit more filming and essentially my job was to just constantly be communicating with people and like gauging comfort levels and, oh, well, this person's comfortable to shoot outside. So let's go get this scene shot or mm-hmm. whatever. And, um, but, uh, then we finally, um, got most of it done towards the end of COVID and then for the past uh, for the past six, seven months, um, has been just solid post-production, just full, like my partner Tash is the lead editor. He's, yeah. he's a wizard, um, at editing. Um, 
and he, I essentially locked him in his editing room since October. <laughs> and is it basically just him doing all the editing? No, well, it's a close collaboration with him and Dan, our director. Okay. So Dan Minsky's the director. He's an amazing writer. He's an amazing director. He was, you know, you can see him in the film when he's mm -hmm. great. And she runs the interviews. Um, he's like. Uh, um, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. He's like a drill bit. When we need to get to the core of something, Dan comes out and he can go right to the core. He is a really. That's a talent. It's a, it's a, it's a very good talent and it helps translate that film into something that's actually the core and the, the deep meaning that it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so it's essentially Dan and Tash, um, working in the editing room for months. And, um, Dan being the director, he, how, uh, he basically is a, turns into a story editor once we get into post-production mm -hmm. and helps direct Tash on, okay, we need to put this part here, this part here, and then Tash will build the scene and then they'll look at it and revise it and revise it and revise it. And it's just been essentially Tash and him in editing for six to eight months. So I'm watching the production. It looks flawless. looks fantastic. Oh, what thanks. are you thinking when we're watching it? Aside from one of our cameras or one of our screens here having a bit of lag in it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that, you know, as I want it to be presented well. So that's, that's my main thing when, when I present it. Um, I've seen it so many times, um, Tash and Dan, like all of us have seen it so many times. There's been so many revisions and mm. so many iterations of, of how it's going. So I'm, I'm curious to see what, how it's going to be received by people. Mm -hmm. um, we just had our um, cast and crew screening where we had um, the majority of our cast out and everything. And we're just, we're able to share it. And thankfully, most of our um, cast and crew, that was our first time seeing it. And so it was, uh, it was super, it was pretty emotional, mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was great to see that validation from people, um, about the messaging and how we've put it together and how we've crafted it because it's a very, very delicate subject. And in the conservation world, we talk all the time that we need to, um, share the message, you know, we, as hunting and fishing, uh, people, mm -hmm. um, when we come back from those adventures, we always talk about how there's that, like, that thing that we can't quite explain. Yeah. Like, is, there's that, like, feeling, you know, when you step out, when you, when you go hunting, you take that first step into the bush and you're like, ooh, yeah, there's magic here. Ineffable feeling. Yes, yes, exactly. So we talk about that. So we're, we're, so as a, as a film production company, we've always been trying to explain that, uh, to people and to, to try to convey that it's not easy. It's one of the most difficult things ever. Mm. Um, this one, because of the client, because of the time, because of the story, because of the characters we have in there, we feel like it finally helps relay some of that emotion that needs to be relayed in this conservation space. Because in conservation, there's no black and white. It's all gray. It's all nuance. It's all about just sitting down and having these meaningful conversations. And maybe you have that conversation and don't draw a conclusion out of it, but you have to have those conversations and, mm -hmm. and they need to be at that deep level. Mm -hmm. It's There's so many different factors with all of these things. So that's why it was, that's why we did the film the way that we did, that it's emotional and it, it is, it goes to those right places. Um, that we need to for for conservation because as as you know, conservation is worth it and it deserves um, these kinds of things. It's it's a difficult dichotomy because they talk about it should be based on science. There should be no emotion. You shouldn't be basing your opinions on emotion. But in order for people to care to begin with, mm -hmm. to look at the science and look at what solutions could be, there has to be some an emotional tug. They have to care. Well, that's the thing is, is we're human beings. Mm. Like we are emotional beings. Mm -hmm. um, in a, as a kind of ethos of storytelling that we do is, um, you know, there are, we love animals and there's lots of things that people connect to. People will connect like us in the wild sheep society connect to sheep very mm. deeply because we care about wild sheep. Um, other people connect to other animals, but at the core being, we all connect to people most above anything else. And that's because we're emotional, emotive people and human beings. And so that needs to be a big part of it. The, the, the problem is, is that we think emotion is just 
is just this one thing, but it's not. It's swir- it's like a s- marbled swirl into everything that we do and how we exist. Mm-hmm. So it's it is part of the conversation. It's just this whole conversation is more complicated than just oh it, I understand this and this. Right. Yeah. So, and you know, I'm I'm, I'm looking at. It's an interesting idea too. So you're, you're telling the emotional connection with the wildlife and, and the outdoors, but you're using people as the catalyst or as the, exactly. the carrier here too. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's the big thing is there's, there's really no secret to what we do, um, in film is we just, we look at these situations and go through these, um, scenarios and these conversations and these complications through people's eyes. Mm -hmm. And if you can see through people's eyes then you can connect in that human. And then that's the same as when we talk in in like hunting and fishing trips and we're like, oh, that connection that I can't quite explain, Mm. right? It's that same kind of uh, emotional connection, which a lot of people are scared of their emotions. So. (laughs) Funny how that is, eh? Even though that's such a big part of how we interact and why we make our decisions and how we respond to things and how we just what formulates our thought process is yeah. so emotional based. Yeah. Yet people try to divorce the emotion from the intellectual side of things. Yeah. And really, you're right. It, it is a marbled, yeah, sort of a marbled quagmire. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah. So there, with this movie, you didn't make this movie for hunters necessarily, ah, did you? Yes. That's correct. That's the, so one of the big things that we, it was mainly our, the direction from the society. They said, we need to, um, share this with the domestic sheep producers because one of the things we've been battling Movi, especially in the States for a long time. And the typical process with battling Movi is removing it out of the wild sheep population Mm -hmm. um, so that it can stop that cycle, stop that spread so that the moms can't pass it on to their um, lambs, moms or ewes can't pass it on to their um, lambs and they stop that cycle. So it's usually a culling. You're culling out the wild sheep, the positive sheep, um, and that's how we've kind of dealt with uh, Movi on the landscape. Mm-hmm. Um, the new thing that's that that we're working on now is, um, and what Helen's kind of going through in this story, is potentially um, creating science that can study if we can remove it from the source. Because mm-hmm. if you remove it from the source, you don't have to worry about keeping them separate. You right. don't have to build these fences. You don't have to, you know, worry about separation as much as you do now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's the big, big um, thing with that we're kind of talking about in this story. So separation requires buy-in. A hundred percent. And and that's right now the best cure for all of this is let's keep them separated, right? Yeah. It's like the yeah. Well, and that's the big thing is um, you know I spent. I spent a lot of time um, with Jeremy from the BC Sheep Separation Program. Mm. Um, and he's essentially that outreach tool. So he'll go to farmers and say, hey, do you know that domestic sheep have this bacteria called Mycoplasma of pneumoniae mm. and that it's a potential deadly, um, can be a de- deadly disease passed on to wild sheep. And for the most part, people are like, I had no idea, uh, willing right. to help. And, but There also are a lot of people that just say, get off my land, don't tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. So it's a delicate thing to uh, communicate and it usually stops at the wallet. Mm -hmm. So if we say, okay, well, these are the suggested ways that you can keep your sheep separate, but, you know, building a, you know, 16 foot double fence is not really something that someone's willing to do for free. Yeah, a lot of money. Enter Wild Sheep Society BC, where they've stepped up and said, okay, that's good. You find a farm. We'll raise money. We'll buy those fences. So they've actually wow. spent, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars on fence lines. Wow. So you, so they install these fences on these farms. But then, you know, it, what's and it, it has happened on farms where a farmer will be like, "Oh, I don't want sheep anymore," and so they spend this money on these these fence fences. And a year later, the farmer's like, "Oh no, I sold my sheep." Right. That's not and. It's not the fix, right? Yeah, exactly. Really. I mean, it's a band aid. It's a band aid, exactly. So the 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 potential excitement throughout everyone that that we've talked to with all the wildlife biologists is, you know, if we can eliminate it from the source, that changes the game. 
that changes the game that a lot of people have been at for a lot of years. Because right now, if I understand this correctly, if I was paying attention properly, <laughs> there is no mandatory regulated or legislated, uh, testing on importing of the, uh, domestic sheep of owning domestic sheep for, for Movi. Yeah. That, that does, it's not even a part of the conversation. And I think one of the people is saying, you know, we need more than legislation. We need policy. Mm -hmm. So legislation is basically the teeth that the government ha creates to enforce policy, but policy would have the a uh, sort of systemic buy-in from interested parties and groups from the people. And it's mm -hmm. created by all of them, including the government. Mm -hmm. So I guess what the individual is saying is he wants, he wants a, a, a fundamental shift in how people approach this to be normalized. Right. And that's where I th see this film as having some really good power because when you're talking about uh, telling the story, telling the story through other people's eyes. I, there's a fundamental principle in rhetoric and in philosophy called charity. And essentially, I guess more the archaic term of charity, it relates to love as opposed to mm. giving money to, to other people. And, uh, in rhetoric and philosophy, they say, somebody says something that you don't see eye to eye with either. It's not even on your radar or you don't agree or you mm. completely disagree try and think about it from the most charitable position, put it in the strongest possible position on their side and see how it stands up to, to analysis. Mm -hmm. And that way you can kind of recalibrate where you're coming from. If all of a sudden you hold a particular belief and you've now used this principle of charity and you're looking at it from the other side and you say, well, I, I can see their point. I can see their background. That allows you to recalibrate your approach. Right. And likewise, if you say, no, oh, my, my position doesn't change. If anything, it's gotten stronger. It allows you, it gives you the, um, the sort of the roadmap, your mental roadmap of how you continue to comport yourself. Yeah. And that's what I see you doing in this by introducing the different, uh, characters as you call them, right? Mm -hmm. These are people, mm -hmm. this isn't a play, but by introducing the different characters and perspectives, you get a real good opportunity to look at it from actual stakeholders, different indigenous groups, uh, conservation officers, farmers, mm -hmm. uh, scientists, biologists, um, the, uh, hunters. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's why presentation and the way it's crafted was so important. And that's mm -hmm. why it took us so long to make this film and especially in post-production and, and because it was such a delicate issue that has to be presented properly. Because if you present that in a different way, if you say, um, hey, farmers, this is what's wrong. This is really important. You need to do this, 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 because it's causing real impacts on the land. Mm -hmm. um, we're saying that, but we're not it saying it's works. your fault. Right. Right. We're not saying this is your fault. Um, how dare you? Mm. We're saying, listen, like, and, and, it, and it's evident with the people we've talked to, the people we work with in the film, and the more people we talk to, and that's the whole point of this this film, is to to have those conversations to say it's not your fault, it's not anyone's fault, but this is what's actually happening, and it's mm. really serious. So define really serious. I uh, heard a number about ninety percent. Yeah. So um, I have an example of a of a herd. I was talking with um, Chris Proctor, who's a senior wildlife biologist. Mm. He's he's been the main Movi um, uh, biologist on, on the Fraser herd. Um, and he was telling me about a herd that um, they've tested. Um, it was a herd of, of around 200 sheep. And within um, a year, and they, they tested um, uh, uh, from the nec necropsies. So they could, mm -hmm. they could test actually the strain of Movi. Um, okay. So just like on uh, COVID, there's different strains. Same with this. So that, not necessarily that they have them all categorized and they know what they all are, but at least they know like, okay, this strain is, a, this is a single strain that killed off this many sheep, which mm. could in theory say that came from one source. Mm -hmm. So one farmer, one exposure. Um, and this herd, in, um, I believe it's been about three years. Uh, they were at 200, now, they're now at 11 sheep. From in one three single years. strain. It, when one single strain of... Uh, of Movi, which we're not saying that it is, but potentially that's from one exposure. Sure. So it's, it's similar to influenza and smallpox when 
you know, Europeans came where, you know, the other population doesn't have the immune system, live with it. Mm -hmm. And that's how rampant it just spreads. So if domestic sheep have Movi and they're able to kind of live with it, um, is that something that would be of concern for the domestic farmers? Like, does it change the taste of the meat? Mm -hmm. Is it going to change the life cycle of that animal to being suboptimal for profit? Yeah. Well, that's interesting because what we discovered along the way, and as the kind of the farm we were working with discovered as well along the way, is that Movi's actually more detrimental to their herd than they thought. Mm. So having their domestic sheep Movi positive, um, actually they've been seeing significant die-offs within their domestic flock. Mm. Uh, there was another, so um, we follow Helen along her trial um, with one farm. She actually did another farm um, in BC and that farm almost lost their entire flock from a domestic sheep farm from Movi. Wow. Thankfully with treatment and eliminating Movi out of the herd, Herd, flock, herd, wild, flock, domestic. <laughs> I get those mixed up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and now her her flocks bounce back and they're healthy. So there's a lot of complications that it's even uh, that domestic farmers are finding out that, you know, having rampant movi within their domestic sheep is actually causing detrimental, um, a detrimental impact on their flock. And, and you know, a lot of... Um, these sheep are not necessarily, a lot of the sheep that we've kind of done are for wool production, mm. which is, you know, you want more and you want good quality wool. So even Movi positive um, sheep, their wool production is weak. Mm. So they produce wool, but it's very thin and it's, it's pretty much sheared off and put in the compost bin. Interesting. So there's, there's, there's detrimental impacts for the domestic yeah. Um, world as well. So that, that creates policy buy-in as well, right. even if it's just talking to the pocketbook. Yeah. Yeah. And in order to treat them, we're watching, it's what a five day process currently. Mm -hmm. There is nasal flushes, which looked just <laughs> delicious. <laughs> there was, yeah. Were there injections as well? Yeah. There, so there was an injection and a nasal flush. Okay. Um, and this, so this, and this is just, it's interesting getting to learn about, um, Helen and doing her trial, um, I, I feel for her because she, what she she's a scientist trying to produce a paper that says this either works or this doesn't work. Right. But she going down that path to just create the science to say it works or doesn't work. She's getting roadblock after roadblock, whether that's funding, whether that's politics, whether that's people st step stepping in and saying, oh, this isn't right. You shouldn't be doing this. And she's just like, whether it's right or wrong, I need to see this through to the end mm. so that we can determine if it is, yes, a viable solution or not. Um yeah. I, so. Yeah. That's, I, I'd say that's difficult because so often I find that people look at solutions without looking at what the actual problem is or the level of impact on it. Cause yes, they might be correct in their solution. Their solution can work mm -hmm. and a solution is worthwhile for that problem. But where does that problem stack up against what, what's the buy-in from the scientific community? What's the emotional buy-in from the public? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some important things out there that people just don't care about, yeah. right? Because yeah. they just don't know. And that's where having these conversations here on the podcast, having these videos out is, uh, helps reach more people and at least puts them on the radar. Like yeah. somebody in the UK might turn around and say, what do I care about wild sheep? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, that's, it's, uh, you know, when we talk about, you know, having Movi free flocks and, and, you know, kind of testing animals and we talk about, you know, the, the biggest issue is like, oh, uh, she, only sh domestic sheep that are within range of wild sheep are a concern. Mm. But then you have the idea of like, um, the farmer that we, that we, that was in our film, they got Movi into their herd because they imported a sheep from Ontario. Mm. There's no mandatory testing. There's nothing like that. So someone on the island, say, where there's no sheep, sells a sheep to um, a farmer in Kamloops where there are sheep. They don't care. They don't care about Movi or don't want them to be tested right. or whatever. All of a sudden import a sheep unknowingly into sheep range. Right. And that's where things can happen. So. So I had two questions that kind of popped up into my mind, which mm. you might not know the answer to. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I should ask Helen. I'm okay with that. <laughs> but first one was. We watched Helen and, uh, her team go through and, uh, treat these sheep and had a massive reduction in Movi after putting the, uh, the nasal flush and the injections. Can they be reinfected? Well, yeah, that's the complicated thing. It can be okay. for sure. It, it can happen at any point and it will, unless there's 
policy. And there's uh, a process in place of if a if a, a sheep is coming into a flock um, or you're buying a sheep from other where they have to be tested. Mm -hmm. So as Jeremy said in the film, it's like, yeah, you can have sheep wherever you want, mm -hmm. but let's just make sure they're, you know, free of this, you know, deadly disease that, that affects wild populations on a very serious level. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, reinfection can happen and it, and it can. And I mean, but I, I don't want to speak out of turn because we're getting into a bit of science and stuff from, right. from what I understand, it can reoccur and it can happen. So that's, that's, the, that's the thing is we're getting into a world of like unknown and development. So we need to be patient and we need to like, uh, just, just go along with what the science is saying mm -hmm. and that, which it defines science. I'm not going to try to define science, but <laughs> science is constantly evaluating and reassessing. Of course. And, uh, trust the science. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Trust the science. It's yeah. in stone here. <laughs> exactly. Right? Which that's not science. No, that's not exact. That's exactly not science. Right. It's the exact opposite of science. That's right. Yeah, exactly. I guess the other one was, okay, for the wild sheep, there is a, uh, a capture and test process. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, Pretty cool to see, pretty cool to watch, mm -hmm. a lot, lot of hardworking people that, um, and big hearts. Now, obviously if you capture one that has Movi, it's out in the wild. If we don't have some sort of a cure for it, your only other option is to put that animal down, to yeah. euthanize it. Yeah. Now what's to stop the w sheep that are being let go that have been tested as negative from now being handled by humans who have touched movie positive mm -hmm. sheep and being let go. Is that, that um, transmission for, like that? I mean, like during the capture and call events, everything's very, um, clean, sterile. So they're, mm. you know, everybody there is designed. It's, it's, it's a designed process to not transmit from, you know, if we're handling a wild sheep and, mm. you know, working around their nose that we're not going to cross contaminate sheep. Um, so during that event, it was very scientific. Okay. <laughs> it was very kind of, it, it was basically a lab in the field. Okay. So, um, it was a very, you know, Helen was the lead on that and she was very, um, that's the amazing thing about Helen is that, um, she's, an amazing leader. Um, but she can, she can also be a bit of a goofball, um, <laughs> you know, and, but people follow her. Mm. Uh, like when, when she says this goes this way, everybody says yes. You know, like it's just, it, it, she's just so well respected because she knows what she's doing and because she knows how to, how to basically command a group mm. in a very respectful, meaningful way to get everybody on board, which mm -hmm. is the definition of a leader, yeah. a good leader, right? Yeah. So leadership's the art of influencing human behavior. So as to accomplish a mission in the manner so desired by the leader. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> I couldn't have said it like that. <laughs> um, but so, so that's, but that's the crazy thing when like, when I was getting into this, when we were having these conversations with biologists, I'm like, okay, well, you know, we, we capture and call, we call out all the positive sheep. What's to say that. Uh, a farmer just doesn't bring in some sheep and then they're exposed again. He's like, nothing says that. Like that could right. happen. Right. That's what we're dealing with on the landscape. So again, it's not to say that it's all domestic sheep or domestic farmers problem or, or issue and they're to blame, but it's just to say if everyone was aware of this and knew and we tested animals to know if they're, po even if they're movie positive, you know, to isolate them. Mm. Or, you know, to keep them out of um, sheep range. So if an island, uh, a domestic farmer on the island has movi positive sheep, we're not saying you have to have them all treated and, and, and done, but like don't sell that sheep to a, um, a big horn range or, or a thin horn range farm. You know, right. like just be aware of, of what's going on and the impacts that it could be. It's avoidable. It's avoidable. And as one person said, it's absolutely avoidable in the movie there. <laughs> exactly. Interesting. <laughs> so yeah. when does the movie come out? Yeah, that's the golden question. So okay. that's, that's what we're doing. Um, and thankfully the society is on board with it as we're doing this a little more unique because the goal is to have engagement beyond our hunting conservation echo chamber, mm -hmm. which is echoes pretty, pretty loudly. Of course. You know, we, we speak to each other a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so we want to reach beyond that. So actually one of the, the things that they, 
really asked us to do was to go after film festivals because that has potential to then reach outside and go mm. beyond. And we really did, we did a conscious decision to focus on the human element of this, of this whole story so that it can reach beyond. Mm. So we're going through the festival circuit, which typically happens in the fall and winter. And right now is the application process for festivals. So it's basically just getting submitted nonstop to festivals. <laughs> Fun. Yeah. And so, but instead of it just being on lockdown until festivals come out, um, we're going to do a private tour events throughout the kind of spring and summer. Okay. So we're... Um, on the website, moviefree.org, we're going to be releasing kind of the event dates and, and where we're going to host it. Um, and the first screening, which is a Wild Sheep Society of BC membership only event, okay. um, but it's in Prince George on April 23rd. Um, it's Horn Aging with Bill Jex. And then at the same time, um, well, we're going to do Horn Aging. I think things start around two o'clock and then in the evening, we're going to have dinner and watch the movie. So... That's very kind cool. of the, our very first like public uh, kind of members only screening. Right. Um, but then like basically we're just securing locations and dates um, through the spring and summer um, all to be announced uh, because things are being secured. So, yeah. So who do you most want to get this message in front of? Um, it's the farming community. That's yeah. who we're, that's who we're, um, that we want to, that's who we want to watch it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's so 4-H clubs, um, that's a big one. Um, anyone in agriculture, um, fall fair events, uh, stuff like that. Anybody that's, that's deals with the agricultural industry or farming or, or anything like that. That's our target audience. So we're not, we're not speaking to we are speaking to the hunting community, mm -hmm. but everybody I think in the hunting community under, is going to understand and love this message and we're not going to have a, a difficult time. So we're really going after the domestic um, sheep producers. That's our target audience. Interesting. So what could people listening to this podcast do to help get that message further if the video is only going to be shown in a few <laughs> private places in a film? Well, I mean, that's the thing. Like it's still – we. We're, we're, I, we're not trying to, um, be a, a blocker and we're not trying mm. to be a roadblock to, you know, oh, this is exclusive, but what we're trying to do, and it's kind of worked out well that right now, I think everybody is craving getting out and doing things and oh, yeah. going to events. So, um, by having these screener events, we can, we can put seats in, uh, in the, I don't, I don't want to say it's going to be a theater, but uh, sure. the location that the filming's at. Sure. And and the main goal from that is that we have people like we're doing right now. We watch the film and now we're talking about this issue and we're talking and raising awareness about it. Mm -hmm. So we can show the film and then we can have, um, you know, in certain locations, we'll bring people out that were in the film and we have a meaningful discussion about what's next and, and what's going going on moving forward and, and just help solidify and clarify um, what this issue is and what they can do about it. So let's say the universe unfolds as it should. Everything <laughs> happens in a way where it's, uh, it gets a message out and people become aware of movie mm -hmm. and steps are taken to introduce policy and legislation. So it can be either eradicated or properly controlled. Mm -hmm. Um, what's next? Well, the, the, the big plan or, or what's happening is that the movie's still in the landscape. You know, if everything by tomorrow, the, the switch flipped mm -hmm. and now we're, we're, we're working on, you know, treating and basically creating a Movi free domestic population, mm -hmm. Movi's already still on the landscape. So there's a lot of work to be done. And there is, you know, as we highlighted in the Fraser river system, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of sheep there and it's very rampant throughout the entire system. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of work on the landscape that still needs to be done, done to, to eliminate that from the landscape. Um, Moving forward, I think it's just, it's, it's about, um, not bringing those preconceived ideas into conversations, but being open and collaborative on, on, on working towards the same kind of goal mm. of, you know, making sure that we have healthy domestic sheep and we have a uh, healthy, uh, wild sheep population, um, mm -hmm. out on the landscape. So wow. again, like we've kind of talked about how these conf 
con conservation conversations. Oh, that's a <laughs> that's a good one. It's like saying Irish wristwatch. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to say that one. No, I'm not even going <laughs> to attempt that. But it, it's about. Um, just knowing that we're working on this together, it's not like, okay, it's fixed, boom, move on to the next one. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, it's still complicated and there's still, and now there's going to be people turnover and then we're going to probably deal with a new government essentially um, at some point, mm -hmm. you know, a new ministry will come in and you know, so we just have to be collaborative and work together on it. Yeah. Well, having that conversation, getting keeping it open and open to critical review, because maybe somebody turns around and says, no, there's a completely different approach that we could be taking. Right. But that doesn't happen without having the conversation. 100%. But it also raises a level of awareness for just caring for what's happening and the impact that we have as humans by sticking our finger in the bowl of water and not expecting to see ripples, because there will be yeah. ripples. <laughs> We've uh, had our fingers in the, in water. For a long time. Well, so long, so long that now we have to make the, uh, the difficult decisions of if we take our finger out completely, what effects are we going to have? Right. Right. Yeah. That's a good. And you know, Shane Mahoney said it well, I thought he says, um, uh, you know, people have this idea about there's us and there's the animals and that somehow we have dominion over mm -hmm. the animals. Yeah. That's not the question. It's, we are an animal and we are just as much a part of this earth as they are a part of it. And we work with them and they work with us. So finding a way to be able to, like I say, stick that finger in the water, I, um, was, uh, Stephen McIver and he's a, uh, biologist and re regulatory, sorry, he's a, um, analyst, a regulation analyst and, oh yeah. uh, biolog, uh, oh, now I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, he's a smart guy, works for the, right, federal, he works That's for the provincial right. government here. <laughs> And, uh, he was talking about, uh, the impact of, let's say just bear hunting on, mm. in the Haida Gwaii. Mm -hmm. And when LEH was introduced, they were looking at the numbers of bears that were being taken out of there. And it was, you know, not many at all, but mm -hmm. the second they introduced LEH and put it on the radar, they're looking at like 200 applications coming through. Like everybody mm -hmm. kind of wanted to go in and hunt bears and on, on the Haida Gwaii, the second that they raised the awareness that, Hey, maybe there's. There's bear hunting happening right. here. Yeah. So, uh, that was an unintended consequence of, mm -hmm. um, enacting some policy and, and legislation. I guess the other side of this is there is a possibility of bringing in everyone saying, holy crow, look at these sheep. I better get to them before they're gone. Right. I better come out and talk to a friend in, yeah. in the U S he's like, man, you have a general open season for sheep up there. That's insane. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, all of a sudden having an unintended consequence of people rushing to, uh, to, to fill that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That, well, man, if we want to get into. It, it's a rabbit hole, but yeah. it's just sort of a side, <laughs> a side thought on, on just trying to navigate how we conduct ourselves as people who love the outdoors and love the wildlife and how we have these conversations, uh, in a way that will affect a positive, mm, um, yeah. Repercussion. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a big message that, um, we're trying to cultivate and kind of show is that it, it takes this conversation and it takes, it does take emotion as much as most people mm. don't want to touch on their emotions. If you cry in this film with it, which a lot of people do, that's completely okay. You don't have to suck that <laughs> tear back in. Just let it flow. Yeah. It's human. You know, we are humans. We are emotion, sure. right? So. Sure. Um, the, the delicate balance is, you know, emotions also go the other way when we get frustrated and when we get angry and when we get upset. So it's like, we're emotional beings. We're allowed to get upset. We're allowed to get angry. We're allowed to get uh, emotional. It's just about how you deal with that and how you kind of you mm -hmm. know, cultivate those situations. So, mm. yeah. Is there anything else we should be talking about before we look at wrapping things up here? Man, I think we got it. Like we, we've talked about the film. I was kind of in my head thinking about, okay, well, well, but man, you're good at this. You know, you know when to cue and when to ask the right question. So uh, I'm still figuring it out. I tell you, <laughs> it, everyone's a learning, a learning experience. Yeah, each yeah. person, each one it's uh, but it's fun. That's good. I, it, this is a bit of like what we do in film too, is we kind of, have these little, I was, I was saying before, when somebody kind of lets you into the circle and you get to know them, it's mm -hmm. a little energizing. That's, these are like uh, a pressure cooker of, of that where you can sit down and get to know someone and have these kind of 
the, like coming into this, I didn't know or how I didn't know how our conversation would go or, or where we go. But man, we went to some some great places that are meaningful. And, and uh, as uh, uh, yeah. Seb, Seb Lavoie, he was a uh, past podcast guest. He mm-hmm. says, you know, meaningful conversations with meaningful people. Just mm-hmm. absolutely love it. Yeah. And all I really knew about you was that you were the uh, recent recipient of the Sitka Diverge 10. Yeah, uh, that's you right. won, you won the <laughs> top place in your category there. Yeah, the big game one. Yeah. That was amazing. And I'm looking at it like, man, that is such a cool picture. Uh, yeah, that will, um, I can tell you a story about that picture if you want. Uh, I want to hear it. Maybe we'll we'll end on a story. Let's so, do that. Um, we were up filming in the in the Yukon. Um, uh, it was myself, Tash, and um, the guy that did all the post production on audio on our film here, Mike Pedersen. He was doing field audio for us up there. So it was um, the three of us plus two hunters, and we were going out. We were just supposed to get foot. We, we were doing this film on this um, this hunter. Um, and it was a story of him being a vegan. So he was vegan to hunter. You've probably seen it if you've been on one campfire. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, we were up there and we said, we said to Carl, we said, listen, I, I, we just need footage of you going out. You know, if we see a bison, great. We had a day, we rented some snowmobiles, we'll just go out and we'll just get some atmosphere and just get a general vibe of you hunting. Um, and, uh, so we're out in the Yukon Boreal. I remember in the morning, we're from the South. We're not used to minus 35, minus 40 <laughs> degrees. Yeah, yeah. Tash and I in the morning, as we're gearing up, ta- we were both freaking out. Tash was a bit more vocal. <laughs> and um, the other hunter said, oh, Tash, I got some tracked in, in the truck. I'll get you some. He's like, yeah, yeah, please. And we all kind of stopped and looked at him. And he goes, tracked in like a man. <laughs> 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 and uh, so it was cold. And we yeah. were like outside of our element. Um Anyways, we were, we were out, we felt, we got great footage of him hunting, quote unquote, but they actually were hunting. Mm-hmm. That was, we got what we needed. And then sure enough, like three, f- I think it was towards the afternoon, like four o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, there's, there's six or seven bison on that hilltop that's two kilometers away. And we're like, yeah, I mean, yeah, we're yep. not going to say don't go because we want to go home. Let's, uh, we're doing it. Let's do it. So we go down to the lake, we park the snowmobiles and we do like a two and a half kilometer hike. And Carl and and his hunting buddy are like, Carl's a beast. Mm. Like we are like sweating and like trying to keep up with Carl. And he's just like beast mode hiking, but like Mm -hmm. calmly through the snow and we're just going up and we get up to the bed site and the bison are slowly walking. So we're just tracking them quietly, quietly, quietly. Sure enough, right around sunset, um, we come across and there's, the big bison head just leaning over, looking right at us. And um, the hunter that was with Carl, so Carl didn't have the bison tag, the other guy did. Mm. Um, and um, he had a clean shot, took a shot, and it was the craziest thing. And you can see it in the film. Um, they all went head to toe. I think there was about six or seven. It felt like 20. Mm-hmm. But there was like six or seven of them, and they just went like a choo-choo train, just like right like past us, just went wow. like one. Um, and so we were like, did you get like, how was He's like, yeah, the shot felt great. Everything felt good. They're massive animals. Big target. A big target. But yeah. they're also, they can suck up a 300 wind mag. Big no time. problem. Big time. No problem. So we, we go along the trail and we're seeing these little splits of blood. We're like, okay, we've got confirmation. So we're mm-hmm. tracking and tracking, tracking, but they're light. They're like, like mm-hmm. uh, it, not, it wasn't like, oh, this bison's going to be down soon. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're tracking, tracking, tracking on foot. And then it gets to a certain point where we're like, okay, let's go back and get the snowmobiles and it's dark. Um, we'll come back and we get the snowmobiles and we're tracking, tracking. And then it's just like, it's getting late. And, um, me, Tash and Mike are just like, okay, yeah, well, I think we're going to wrap this up because right. you know, we're not finding this bison. Right. And, uh, we pull over and Carl's like, yeah, just go. He's talking to the other guy. He's like, yeah, go grab that and that. And then he comes over to us like yeah so go start collecting some firewood and blah, blah, blah. and we're like what we're gonna have a fire what like aren't we going back to the truck and like going home this is like probably 11 12 o'clock at night and we're like and it's still like a three hour snowmobile ride back to the truck okay. he's like no no we're spending the night here um and we're gonna go keep looking we're not gonna leave an injured bison good. out in the mountain we're like oh Nobody argued. No, everyone yep. was like, okay, we're good. I guess we had no food. We had no tent, no sleeping bags. We were there for a day trip. Carl had one. <laughs> How warm was it? How cold was it? Minus 35. 
Okay. It, exactly. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And uh, he had one mountain house as like an emergency in his <laughs> snowmobile. So the five of us shared one mountain house around a fire. We kind of, you know, found where there were two trees and, you know, read where the wind was coming from mm-hmm. and essentially built a fire and five guys spooned out, <laughs> spooning out in the middle of the boreal yeah. in minus 35. So you're like spooning. And you get really cold and you stand up and you go rotisserie around the fire. We keep the fire going all night. Mm-hmm. The good thing about the boreals is dry. Right. Everything burns. Right. It's great. And the trees are so frozen that you just shake them and you can knock them down. It's amazing. <laughs> um, it's way different than, you know, growing up in a rainforest. Right. Knowing that nothing burns. Nothing at all. Yeah. Everything's just so like soaked. He was so right nonchalant. Through. I was like stressing out that we're going to keep a fire going. How are we going to start a fire? Well, yeah. it was fine. So we had a fire, we're spooning, we're doing this routine all night where, you know, you might get 20 minutes mm. of sleep and then you're up because you're so cold, get to the close to the fire. And then I remember waking up, we're all spooning and over the ridge of my friend's back, of Mike's back, I see the Aurora Borealis mm. and I'm sitting there, we're in an all survival mode. It's a pretty good group. We're all pretty positive. Nobody's freaking out. It's mm. all good. Um, I had this conversation with myself. I'm like, oh, it's so beautiful. I have to go get my camera. <laughs> so I like slugged up. Everybody was sleeping at the fire. I went over like the, ca- and of course the camera's packed away in the case. It's in the right, snowmobile. At the I'm bottom. Like, I go to the snowmobile. I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing? And I get the camera and the, the, the sky is just so inspiring. We're talking about being a creative and about it mm-hmm. like energizing. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I like I t- took my gloves off. I could feel all my fingers. I was just energized by it. It was so gorgeous. Wow. And uh, I go and I'm walking around in the bush and um, I'm like, I don't even care if there's something lurking at me. I have to get this photo. <laughs> and I took a bunch of different photos and that one that, that won the prize was, was it. So the fire that you see there, that's where all five guys were spooning. You can kind of see yeah. my, my gators are hanging there, drying out. Um, and then the Aurora Borealis and the stars and the boreal tree, like it was just, it was amazing. That just made that picture a thousand <laughs> times better. Now when I look at it with that story. Yeah, yeah. And then and and then um, we got up the next morning and uh, no bison. No bison. Yeah. Carl, Carl was very, um, he kind of taught us more about how that was. And he said like, if, if it was injured, it would have broken off from the herd, mm. but it was a strong, the blood disappeared and it was a strong, they were all together mm. uh, moving away. So unfortunately no bison, mm. we didn't, but um, uh, I can't remember the coffee shop, but we went there and had this like, when we got out, cause everybody was starving, yeah. we had a coffee and the, a cinnamon bun the size of a pie. And each of us had one, and that was you like, like cinnamon buds. Yeah, it was uh, it was amazing. It's so. Like a Fight Club, that breakfast that yeah. he has tomorrow will be the best tasted <laughs> breakfast he's had in his entire life. Yeah, yeah. So we all had some tract, and then we all made it out. Awesome, <laughs> great story, Jesse. Thank you so much for sharing the video with me, the movie with me. Thank you for being on the Silver Core Podcast. Thank you. Mm-hmm.